If you would go ahead and open up your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, that's where we're going to be spending most of our time. And today we're going to be looking at the five motives of evangelism. Now over the past month, we've been diving head first into the Great Commission. Last week, it kind of seemed a little bit out of order as we were focusing on discipleship, but this is intended because discipleship is a focus of First Christian Church, and it's something you've heard and something you're going to continue to hear about. And so I wanted to address that first because it's familiar material. Now over the next couple of weeks, we're going to be getting into something a little bit uh, out of some of your comfort zones. And in fact, we're going to be focusing on that not only here, but at Wednesday Night Live. And our focus is going to be on the first part of the Great Commission, go and make disciples, which means we will be focusing on evangelism. However, I don't want to just say, go tell people about Jesus, because that's a good enough command for people who are gifted with evangelism, people who are extroverts, you know, weirdos. But what I want us to focus on, actually, is, is putting this into practice by first laying the foundation so that you can then have your personal evangelistic approach. Meaning, when we lay the foundation, you can begin to be built and work and serve in the uniqueness that Christ created you to serve. And so today we're going to lay that foundation. But once again, like discipleship, evangelism is non-negotiable. There was a pastor, uh, before he went into seminary, he worked at a brand new hardware store. And oddly enough, I found that this was in the city that I grew up in, in Lake Mary, Florida. And so what he needed to do is he needed to go out to the work sites to make contact with hopeful clientele. And while he did this, he was amazed at the construction process of some crews. Now, I don't know how it is elsewhere, but in Florida, if there's grass or dirt, or like, there's no dirt in Florida, let's be honest. If it's, there's grass or sand, let's put something on it. And so they build these homes or build these apartments all over the place. And this is what he said. You learn a great deal about builders, their values and abilities, if you look at what they build before the caulk and the paint go on, I was amazed at how poorly some of the finest looking homes were actually constructed. Some of those homes had the shoddiest materials in them. Others had good materials, but very poor craftsmanship. Things would be slapped together, jack-legged, and then painted over. However, if the beginning, if the foundation is not squared, if it is not leveled properly and graded properly, none of it matters. There is no fixing it. It has to start right. And so evangelism, this is when we as followers of Christ, when we go out and we advocate, proclaim, stand up for the gospel message. And so in your bulletins, we have a, just a, a, a blanket gospel presentation with scripture involved, and I want to read that. We believe that Jesus is the Christ, begotten of the Father, not created, eternal in nature from eternity's past. He is God and became flesh, born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, perfect and obedient to the law, crucified under Pontius Pilate, submitting himself to the will of the Father as an atoning and substitutionary sacrifice for all who would call on his name for the forgiveness of sins. We know this to be true as all of it is affirmed in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The purpose of this gospel presentation is to give you the scripture that attests to what we believe, the foundation from which we will build. And so this week, I want to encourage you to go through those yourself, read them, memorize them, and see that the Holy Spirit will use those later. But this is the foundation. This is what we need to lay down and settle before we go out to practical evangelism. Do you believe what has been said? Do you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ as revealed through the Lord's word? Paul seemed to. In Romans 1.16, he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of sal for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And so this week, go back through that gospel presentation and go through each and every one of those scriptures, 
Even more, go and look for the other scriptures that teach the same because what, you, what we just read and the scriptures that are there is not ex- exhaustive. There's more scripture to attest to what we believe. Find those, read those, memorize them. As followers of Christ, we're told to go and tell the world of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so this week, I want us to look at the five motives of evangelism. I, I found an article written by Pastor Richard Koken uh, to be very helpful inspiration in this breakdown. The first motive, obedience to Christ. John 14, 15, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. 1 John 5, 3, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. We live in a culture that redefines obedience as some form of slavery. That as a result of fear, which we'll discuss in a moment, we are to be obedient as though we are like a scared puppy to our owner. First Christian Church, do not allow the world to redefine what God has already defined. Now that does cast a much broader net, but today, for our purposes, I just want to look at the redefinition of words. Our world has redefined love, acceptance, discipline, submission, and obedience, to name a few. And the obedience is the one I want us to focus on. See, obedience to God is parallel to one's obedience to a loving father. Now, this may be difficult because there are those who are raised without a loving father. My children, for example, are to obey me because they love me, not because they're afraid of me. And so to the teenagers in the room, this is also true for you and your parents. To say, I love you, and then disobey says more about the action than the professed love. Understand, we all have lived a rebellious life as teenagers. In fact, one of my greatest regrets is that I didn't listen to them more. My life would have been spared an awful lot of heartbreak, hardship, and discouragement had I listened to my dad. And so kids, obey your parents because you love them. Parents, can I get an amen? Moving forward. Jesus, when he called Peter and his brother Andrew, they were out fishing. They were fishermen by trade. And it's actually, it's really interesting as you get into who the disciples were. If I were Zebedee, I would have been pretty upset that Jesus poached most of my employees. You had Peter and Andrew, James and John. They all worked together and they worked with Zebedee. Zebedee owned a fishing company and that's who they worked for. And and Jesus calls them to be his disciples and they go and follow. But when he calls Peter and Andrew, he says in John chapter 14, verse 19, he said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Even Jesus made dad jokes. But this pun made by Jesus, it goes far deeper because I know some of you like to fish. Even though you're terrible at it, you still like it. I can't catch a fish to save my life. And then if I catch it, my wife has to take it off the hook. But when you go and you, you are going out, you're about to go fishing, what do you do? You have to prepare and equip your tackle. You prepare your fishing reel. You make sure your guides are intact. You select your lure, even changing the lure if necessary. You look for the location and you cast in to find where the fish are. Everything you do and everything you have done up to this point is intentional. You can even go further back and go everything you've done up to that point to purchase the gas that goes in the boat, the job that paid for the gas, all of it's leading up to this intentionality of catching fish. Well, the same is true for evangelism. Everything we do, we are in his word, We're listening to sermons, we're being discipled, we're talking with others, fleshing out what we've learned and what we believe. We take interest in people, we grow in love for people, we submit to Christ more each day, we repent, we are shaped more into the image of Christ, and the list goes on and on and on. Our lives are filled with the preparation to go and minister to people. As a follower of Christ, your life revolves around the intentional preparation to evangelize to others that they too would cry out to the Lord as you have. And that's yet another way that God 
does the heavy lifting. God the Holy Spirit indwells us upon salvation to sanctify us, shape us, and he prepares us. He equips us. We read in Hebrews chapter 14, 20 through 21. Now may the God of peace who brought Uh, who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant, that is, Jesus our Lord, equip you in every good thing to do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. We are all prepared to obey this call to go and make disciples because the one who indwells us has empowered us, equipped us, and gifted us to do it. The second motive, fear of Christ. I told you that we're going to be covering this. Again, we're faced with a word that our culture has redefined. I told you to turn to 2 Corinthians. Go ahead and go to verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Verse 11. Therefore, Knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. This fear is not an irrational, paralyzing fear. It is a self-aware understanding of who we are in light of who God is. We are sinful. He is holy. And in this self-awareness, there is fear because of the perfect holiness of God. A great example of this is Isaiah. If we look at Isaiah, who was a faithful servant and prophet of God, what what happened when he was faced with but a faint presence of the glory of God? In Isaiah chapter 6, verse 5, he says, Woe is me, I am ruined. And this word in the Hebrew for ruined is, is perfect for our purposes here and what we're covering because the levels to it are profound. First, It means to be brought to silence. It means Isaiah had no argument. He had no recourse to justify his life, his sins, his actions. Second, it sensed a being of cut off from God. Not that he was, but that his sin created between him and God a realization that I cannot cross this chasm between myself and God. Third, it also communicates one being undone. Isaiah is figuratively naked before God, meaning he cannot hide. He knows there is nothing in his mind and in his heart that is hidden before God. Fourth, it means to be destroyed. He stands before God knowing what should be done. He should be destroyed. And in this moment, he realizes, I no longer deserve the air that I breathe. Now hold on to this because it's going to be completed in our next motive. But before we go there, we we have the fear of Christ. In that, we know what the holy and righteous God of this universe is to do with sinners. What should he do? In fact, this is why we called upon the name of Christ. This is why we cleave to his mercy in the first place. We get it. If we're honest, as adopted sons and daughters of God, this is not the primary experience that we have with our father. The same is also true with with my dad. Our relationship is built upon affection and love, though it was very difficult for him to say it. But we have a great relationship. And we always have. But when I snuck out of the house as a teenager and got caught, that's where I had a holy fear of my father. But the primary experience between me and my father, the primary experience between adopted son and, and daughter of Christ, is not going to be one of fear, but one of love and of, and, of, and of mercy and of grace. And it's going to be good. However, We understand that in order for us to have come to him, there was that holy fear of what we deserved as sinners, as broken creatures, what a holy God should do to us. And then we see, wait a minute, Christ bore it. Christ stepped in, putting on our flesh, putting on our sin, and saying, God, I'm going to receive the punishment that is due them so that I can clothe them in my righteousness. Like the prodigal son who returned to his father, he put his robe on his son covered in pig muck, 
He covered that muck with his robe. We are covered with the righteousness of Christ. But you know, the same is also true. The Western church does take it too far. And we've created at least two generations who have absolutely no fear of God. But then again, that's a sermon for another day. Because we know, because we have cleaved to the mercy of God, being spared from his holy and righteous judgment that we absolutely deserve, we have been given grace. Going back to 2 Corinthians 5, therefore, because we know the fear of the Lord, what does he say? We persuade others. We go and tell people about who Christ is because we understand the fear, because we understand the love, because we understand the grace, which all collide at the cross of Jesus Christ. Because of that, we go and persuade others. The third motive, gratitude to Christ. Because we've been saved from what we deserve, That through Christ Jesus, we have been given the grace of God. Our faith is lived out and expressed with gratitude. Verse 14. For the love of Christ controls us, because we have concluded this, that one has died for all. Therefore, all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. Because we know what we deserve and Christ has taken that punishment on our behalf, with this overflow of gratitude, we are motivated to tell others of this remarkable grace. It's not that God would judge and rightfully condemn, it's condemn sinners such as all of our, such as we were. That is the catalyst of our evangelizing. It is out of this gratitude and love for him that we go and and perform this act of service of evangelism and obedience to the Great Commission that they would hear of a holy and righteous God who loved us first. That God would even offer us a pardon. That's my biggest hurdle, that he would even offer a pardon. And then that pardon was accomplished through his own blood, his own death on our behalf. What remarkable lengths he went to to redeem a stiff-necked and rebellious creation like pigs in mud we were to our sin, covered and slopped with the filth of this world, and we loved it. But the Son For the glory of God stepped out of eternity, stepped out of his kingdom to wrap himself with the same flesh that we desecrated, was tempted and overcame, lived a perfect life. Like a spotless lamb, he took upon his own shoulders our sin, our addiction, our shame, our brokenness, and he conquered our grave, our greatest enemy, our greatest fear, death itself. He conquered it raising to life again in order to give us what we do not deserve, and that is the grace of God, making people who were once enemies of him now beloved sons and daughters and co-heirs to his kingdom. If our hearts do not overflow with gratitude to that, something's wrong. That's why we tell people about our Savior. The fourth motive, the message of Christ Moving down to verse 18. All of this is from God, who through Christ reconciled to himself, us to himself, and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. 
For our sake he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. God has given us all the ministry of reconciliation, entrusting to us the message of reconciliation, which is the gospel. Some people ask this question, well, what is my ministry? Scripture tells us. It's the ministry of reconciliation. The question then is, okay, is that going to be found in serving in the children's ministry? Is that going to be served in, in, in the student ministry? Is that going to be served in the jail to work? Is that going to be fulfilled in Sisters of Strength? These are unique expressions of the ministry that we've been given. The ministry of reconciliation. How is that going to be lived out and played out in each of our lives? That's where the question lies. But that's your ministry. You might say, I don't know what I need to do. I don't know what my ministry is. Scripture tells you right there, it's the ministry of reconciliation. So as you build from this foundation, you begin to see how that is going to be lived out, how that is going to flourish in your life, where God is calling you specifically for your own unique ministry for his kingdom. The fifth motive, the day of Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 1 through 2. Working together with him, then, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in a favorable time I listened to you, and in a day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Look, we live in a time and in a nation where we can boldly evangelize the gospel. We live in a country, we live in a time, we live in a location that we can boldly evangelize the gospel. This scripture is absolutely true. Behold, now is a favorable time. Look, we might propose some things. Well, I might lose my job. Well, we live in a time where you can get another one. Well, I might get called into HR. Well, then proclaim the gospel to HR. We live in a time where our kids can take their Bibles to school and read them. So do it. We can pray publicly. We can proclaim the gospel on the street corner. We can hold up signs and evangelize. We are in no way hindered compared to our brothers and sisters elsewhere in the world. So let's take advantage of that. Let's use this freedom to fulfill the ministry of reconciliation. Go and be bold and take advantage of this freedom that we have and praise God that we have it. But we still have a lot that we can learn from places where our brothers and sisters are forced to be silent and they refuse. And yet they're so passionate and bold in the vigor they have to spread the gospel. Imagine if their government let them. Ours does, at least for now. So let's take advantage of it. Why are we not taking advantage of it? Paul always had a burden that he was living in the last days. As you read through Scripture and you read through what Paul's writing, he believed, I'm living in the last days, that the Lord is going to return. And this was his driving motivator. And frankly, we've lost this. We have forgotten the finality of the Lord's return. The finality of Christ's return. There is no second chance. When Christ returns, he's going to kick in the door, take his children, and lay waste to the rest. I've described this before, but we live in a time where where Christ is both reaching out with one hand that is of pure grace and of pure mercy, reaching out and saying, take it, be received, be a part of my family, be a co-heir to my kingdom, come 
It's reaching out with pure grace that, that you would be received as a son and as a daughter, that your sins would be forgiven no matter how great you think they are. The cross did not break under your sin. He bore it to completion. He said it is finished. And he said, I did that, that you would become my son, that you would become my daughter, that you would become a co-heir, that you would receive this grace. And with one hand, he's holding out this mercy. He's holding out this grace. And while at the same time, he's holding back the wrath of God towards that sin. He's holding back the wrath of God for over 65 million babies killed in the womb. He's holding back that wrath to the mockery of marriage within the world. He's holding back the, that, that wrath for all the lies, the deception, all the crooked business dealings. All the, all, do we need to keep going? Do we recognize what he's holding back and what is due? As he stands in the corner with looking through his brow... The finality of his return is when this hand of grace is no longer extended and this hand of wrath is dropped and he unleashes what he should have unleashed from day one. Only he gave us grace. A day is coming where both hands are going to drop and the grace of God will stop and the wrath of God will be experienced unhindered, unfiltered as Christ did on the cross. We don't understand the finality, and also we don't have a clue of the ferocity of the Lord's return. There is a, there is a feeble, needy, weak Jesus that the Western church has been portraying for decades. A Jesus that just, I need you so bad. Like a clingy middle school boyfriend I just can't, I can't without you. I need you. Let me tell you about the Jesus who's going to return. Revelation 19, 11 through 16. And I saw heaven opened up. And behold, a white horse. And who sat on it is called faithful and true and the righteousness. And in righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire. And on his head are many crowns. And he has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a, from, from his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. That's the Jesus that's going to return. Not a weak, feeble, limp-wristed, clingy, needy Jesus. A king coming back to take what is rightfully his. And he has called us to be co-heirs to that kingdom. He has called us that we would not endure that. Jesus is coming back that way. One of the reasons why our relationship with Christ is so amazing is that he doesn't need us. But he wants us. He doesn't need us at all, but he wants us. How incredible is that? You're going you're gonna to wrestle with that the rest of your life. And you're going to gain more and more depth of understanding of that. But it's going to be something you wrestle with. It's, God, you don't need me, but you want me? The question becomes, then why on earth do you want me? And you're going to wrestle with that because in that want, there is a remarkable love and grace that is given to you that you do not deserve, that I do not deserve. And it just overflows with gratitude that your life is filled with so much contentment and joy that no one can touch, peace that no, no recession can handle. It's the fact that he doesn't need us and yet wants us that makes his love so incredible that makes this relationship so meaningful that this God would want us as sons and daughters. But there is a day where he's going to return and he is going to judge the world. And the Jesus that we've been portraying for years and years and years is not the Jesus that is going to return. 
Are you beginning to see how these motives of evangelism are, are, are falling into place with the message of the gospel and the return of our Lord? The tenacity of it, the, 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 the excitement of it, the, the fear, the gratitude, all of this, it, it, it flows together in all of this. I understand that there's, there's still a portion in your notes that needs to be filled out, and we're going to do that, but, but let's go ahead and pray right now, okay? Let's pray. Lord, give us the eyes to see the importance of living out this faith boldly, without fear, because we know that you are with us. Spur us with a sense of urgency as the day is drawing near that we would never forget that you will return for your bride. That we would take the gospel and proclaim the message of reconciliation to those we work with, to our mail carrier, to our families, to our children's teachers, to our public officials, to anyone you bring into our lives that we would take responsibility for those around us. Lord, give us a burden for the lost, that they would be reconciled to you through Christ Jesus. Amen. In short, I agree with Pastor Koken as he summarized. Therefore, our evangelism should be motivated by obedience to Christ's command, fear of Christ's judgment, gratitude for Christ's love, responsibility for Christ's message, and excitement at the opportunities granted by Christ in the days in which we live. Dear, dear First Christian Church, behold, now is a favorable time. We live in such a favorable time to evangelize and tell people about this remarkable Savior we have. My spurring to you is this. Take advantage of it. Take advantage of this. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We love you. We pray, Lord, that as we go from here, that we would understand these motives a little bit more, that we would take those steps of obedience, that we would understand the foundation from which we are to build, that you would work in us a personal touch to the way that we evangelize to those in this world that we would love them, care for them, and minister to them. But that you would build from this foundation the ministry of reconciliation that you've called each and every one of us to. Help us, Lord, to find that unique call on our life. Help us to take responsibility for the people around us, for the family members we have. Lord, that we would stop being so fearful to tell our families of the gospel that we would not be so fearful to ask if we can pray for them, that we would not be so fearful to proclaim your name in the homes. Frankly, Lord, prepare us for Thanksgiving now, that as that day comes and family comes into town, we are prepared to tell them of this wonderful Savior, of this wonderful King who is reaching out with pure grace to receive them. Change the way we see evangelism, change the way we see our responsibility, Lord, that we would take these steps of obedience. We're not perfect. Lord, we have our flaws. We're not, we're not all good communicators. But Lord, your spirit is powerful. Give us the boldness, the bravery to step out and go, I'm not perfect, but I can't wait to see what God does. That you don't need us, but you want us. And the fact that you've called broken, redeemed sinners like us into the, into the battlefield that we can carry the gospel that saves is truly humbling and exciting. Thank you, Lord, for your love and your mercy. And thank you, Lord, for this mission that we have as we live out our days on this earth, as we eagerly await your return. So in Jesus' name we pray, amen.